Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second webinar uh, on increasing the reach of your research. Um, can I just ask um, uh, people very quickly to put your hands up? Um, so using the hand up function on Zoom, um, put your hands up if you uh, participated in the webinar last week. Okay. Great, that's good to know, that's good to know. Um, so this is obviously, it's kind of a two-part um, webinar. Um, if you if you attended last week, um, you should get a lot out of both webinars, um, but this, this, today's webinar should stand alone if you weren't able to attend last week. Um, the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be posted online afterwards. So um, if you have questions at any point, please pop them in the chat and um, we'll use, use the raised hand function for, for exercises um, throughout the, the webinar today. So today, um, like I said, is, is the second part of the webinar. Last week, we looked at, at a different way of thinking about a paper. So looking at the purpose of the different sections of the paper um, and, and how, to, how to make sure the reader is getting the information they need. And this week really builds on that because I want to, I want to show you how to really tell a story about your research. So how do you create a strong narrative about um, about your work when you're writing a paper. And as I sh also showed last week, um, a lot of what I'm going to, or pretty much everything I'm going to be talking about today, um, you can find in our previous editorials on in functional ecology. Um, and then there's, an, um, if you want more detail and more exercises and more ideas, um, I recommend um, Joshua Schimmel's book, Writing Science. Uh, so some some of the the content has also um, also given there. So just to very, very quickly, um, for, for those who weren't uh, in the webinar last week, um, there are sort of a couple of really basic principles that I'm going to keep coming back to and that you really, really need to bear in mind when you're creating a strong narrative about your research. The first is that the research aims have to guide the writing writing process. So the the aims, the research aims, and that's the, uh, the research question and the hypotheses that you formulated, the overarching aims of the study, they inform all the other parts of the paper. And that's really important to remember because if we rem if we if we keep that in mind, we can create a really strong story showing why we have those research aims how we address them and what we found. So that's the first principle. The second principle is, is this principle of funneling information. And those who were in the webinar last week will have heard this already quite a few times. Um, the general principle is start big, finish small. So always giving the reader the wider context and sort of the broad general information first and then building in details and specifics and complexity um, bit by bit. That way you make sure that you don't lose the reader. And I'm gonna keep coming back to this um, today. So this, this, this idea of creating this information funnel from, from big to small um, is really quite an important technique. And this technique and most of the techniques that I'm going to talk about today and show you today, um, they're, they're really important because they're, they're really about structuring the text to create a strong narrative. And the reason this is important is that if you have the correct text structure and the, the information is in the place where the reader expects to find it, it doesn't matter if your English isn't perfect. It doesn't matter if you're writing in English as a foreign language. And I will show you an example of um, at least one paragraph written by, by an English speaker, a uh, native English speaker, where the information is in the wrong place. And it is very hard to understand the paper 
when when the structure um, is incorrect. So this is a really, really powerful tool for anybody who's writing in English um, as a foreign language. Getting the text structure right is more important than having the perfect grammar and the precise words that, um, that English speakers might have. So um, the very first thought you should have really when you're writing your paper is who is going to read your paper. And this sounds very simplistic, but often um, we're thinking about, oh, I need to publish. I need to, I need to, I need to get published. I need to build up my CV. I need to have my publication list. Um, and um, you know, I was always told, well, a study isn't done until it's published. Research isn't done until it's been published. And actually we can expand that and say, um, the research isn't relevant until it's been read and it's been cited. So the most important question for us is, is really who's going to read um, the paper? And of course, in the first instance, that's probably an editor and reviewers. And then we need to know what, what they're looking for. So how do we give ed the editor and the reviewers what they need to see you know, this paper is worth publishing? And once it's published, um, the questions are, who, should, who, who do you think should read the paper? Why would they read it? And what are they going to get out of it? So writing papers, we, we, we tend to think of that from a, um, I, I suppose, a self-centered or a selfish um, point of view that we need papers to build our careers. But actually, papers are a form of communication and we need to write with the reader in mind. The purpose of a paper is to communicate our research in a way that other people can benefit from it. So it's worth always bearing that in mind when you're writing. Now, the best way to communicate anything really is through a story. So we've used stories to transmit information for thousands and thousands of years. And there are loads of examples of how we've been able to, um, to uh, spread the word or, or pass down information over generations using really strong stories. And um, we, can, we can create a story out of our research. So the ultimate goal of a, of a paper isn't to present data or present results. It's to show the understanding that we've derived from the data and the understanding that we gain from those results and how that is going to advance our knowledge or our understanding of the, the research field. So in the process of, um, I guess, uh, in the research process, we, we get our data um, from that data, we gain information, we turn that information into knowledge. And in the process of writing the paper, we need to make sure that that knowledge translates into understanding. So we can do this by thinking about creating, uh, about telling a story in our paper, right? So writing a really clear narrative to show how the study addresses the research aims, using evidence, so whether that's data or citations, um, to support objectives and the approach we're using and our interpretation. Another quite important thing of telling a story is trying to recreate excitement for the subject. So why are we doing this research? Why are we curious about this? Why are we excited about the results? And then asking ourselves, you know, will readers understand why the study is important, why it's relevant, why we have this excitement or curiosity for this particular um, uh, research topic? So these are sort of the, the overarching ideas behind creating a research story and a strong narrative evidence, um, bringing in that, that, that excitement or that curiosity, whether that's um, promising you know, a novel result or a new method or a better understanding, that's that's how we can show that the, the study is important and relevant. And then, of course, if we're telling a story, stories have a specific structure. If you think to any book you've read, for example, I mean, stories have a beginning and a middle and an end. Books, films, TV series, um, they all follow pretty standard structures. And one of these structures is, is called OCAR. 
So that's the abbreviation for opening, challenge, action and resolution. So opening is what is the story about and what does the reader need to know to understand the story? So if you think to um, any novel you've read or any film you you've, you've watched, there's probably some kind of opening with a little bit of background, um, setting the scene, um, making sure that um, that you understand what's what's happening next and, and introducing your characters. Then at some point, there's a challenge. Um, in this case, for you know, this this might be um, I don't know. Um, in in an action movie, somebody gets kidnapped or something gets blown up. Um, in a research paper, this is this is our research aim. This is our knowledge gap. This is the issue that we're trying to resolve with our study. The challenge. Then, of course, there's a lot of action that happens to address that challenge, and and then you have your happy happy end, the resolution. So what has changed as a result of that action? So this is this story structure is really, really powerful. It's it's something we use an awful lot in creative writing, like I said, in films. It's also often used in journalism, um, in documentaries, all of, you know, it doesn't have to be fiction. And we can use it, we can apply this story structure to research papers. So first of all, the opening is basically our background. What is the larger issue? What is the background to this issue? So this is obviously um, sort of our mostly our introduction. And then there's the challenge. This is the research aims, the knowledge gaps, the specific questions that we want to answer. The action, how do you go about answering those questions? And the resolution is what do you learn from the work? What, what conclusions can we draw? Um, how have we, how can we interpret this? And we use this structure for, I've, I've put here specialist journals, by that I mean not something like science or nature that is very, very general and have more essay style papers, but the, the classic paper structure, um, introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusions, pretty much use this um, OCAR structure. And I'll show you how. Um, I've already said the opening is that's fairly clear. It's the introductions so are introducing the characters, whether that's species or systems um, and and the wider issue that you that you want to address. Then the challenge you've narrowed down to the specific challenges of the of the research area and the questions that that you're going to answer with your study. And then the action is is really the bulk of the paper. So the methods, what did you do to address the challenge? What did you what did you find? That's the results. And then a large part of the discussion is also what it what it all means. So the interpretation. And then the resolution is the key take home message in the conclusion section of the paper. So towards the end of the discussion. So you can see that we, we can actually use story structures um, for scientific papers. Um, I can see I've I've had a a question in um in the uh in the in the chat um non about non-native English writers is it okay to use AI apps to improve the English in our manuscript um I can give you I can give you um the answer from functional ecology which is yes so we actually encourage um uh, encourage authors to use um, things, AI-based apps to improve the English in the manuscript, as long as the manuscript is, uh, as long as the, the original writing is original um, and and it's just a matter of improving some of the, the language or the, the, the grammar, that's absolutely fine. And um, we, we basically ask authors to provide a statement saying um, that, that they have used, say, chat GPT to improve um, the English language of the paper. Um, this is this is a question that is, is coming up an awful lot and it might change, but at the moment, um, um, and I think uh, Amaya and um, Amelia can, um, can maybe add to that or just confirm that I've remembered that correctly. Um, but yes, and I also, I also encourage students to do the same, that, um, you know, we want papers 
um, thesis chapters that are well written and easy to follow and easy to understand. And this is one of the um, the ways we can do this and a good tool. The important thing is that it's that it really is based on your original writing and and obviously not plagiarized. So um, getting back to our story structure. Um, Basically, these these three of these positions. So I said the action is the bulk of the paper. Most of the paper is actually the action, but the three most important things are the opening, the challenge, and the resolution. And this is this may be a bit counterintuitive. So most of our paper, the action bit, is actually not that important to the to the reader and the general understanding of the paper. Um, I mean, it is important. But the, the, the absolute focus is the opening, the challenge and the resolution. They need to be really clear and they need to be in the right place. So basically, if readers only read the opening, the challenge and the resolution, which is you know pretty much, hopefully, you've got in your abstract, um, then they can understand what the paper is about and they can understand why the paper is important. What's really key here is that the opening, the challenge and the resolution, they come in specific positions in the paper. And if you put the wrong information in those positions, the reader will misunderstand what the paper is about. So, as I said, the opening is pretty much the introduction. We talked about the introduction last week. Um, it should be it should be concise. It should be focused. Um, and and it should be, well, four or five paragraphs maximum. And the introduction itself, we have, you know, the, the, the topic in the broader sense, which is obviously the opening. Then we have um, the narrower scientific context, the key knowledge gaps and the project's novelty. So why the topic is important in the broader sense, that's the opening. That needs to be in the first paragraph of the introduction. Then in the second paragraph, we have, we're have we narrowing down, so we're using our funneling to get from that wider topic down to the specific scientific context of the study. And then we're introducing the key knowledge gaps, and that's the challenge. And then finally, in our last paragraph, um, we were presenting the project. So how the project is going to address those knowledge gaps. So we're, we're promising the resolution. So already in the in the, this, this classic four paragraph introduction structure, we need to have these three key positions, opening, challenge, and at least the promise of a resolution. We're not actually resolving anything, but we're going to show this study is going to address these gaps. So these three, these three um, key points need to be in the right place in the introduction. And that's why this classic four paragraph introduction works so beautifully. It means the reader is a, will receive these um, key pieces of information in the right place. Then, you know, I've talked a lot about funneling. Um, we also need to think about what happens across the whole paper and these three key positions, um, because as a whole, we're, narrow, we're narrowing down from the opening to the challenge. But when we get to the resolution, we need to open up again. We need to broaden our funnel out again. And that means we, we end up with an hourglass structure um, of, of, of a scientific paper. So essentially, um, and, and this, this hourglass structure is quite important because our opening is presenting a broader issue. We're narrowing down to the specific challenge, but our resolution needs to match the opening, the breadth of the opening. So basically, if we have a really broad opening and, um, and you know, we're, we're kind of promising to, um, to, to solve the whole of climate change. And then the resolution is that we've shown one small mechanism in one ecosystem, then you're obviously promising too much and the readers will feel cheated. So this is where the 
the, the narrowing down to the subject area becomes really important. We need to narrow down to the challenge, but then we need to broaden back out again. So we need to show how addressing that challenge provides a resolution um, that is, for example, more widely applicable. If it isn't more widely ap applicable, then the, the opening needs to be a bit narrower. So those need to match. Then there is also the opposite problem where maybe I've started, I've started my paper talking about a single species or a single ecosystem. I haven't provided much wider context. The reader will immediately think, oh, this study isn't relevant to me because I don't work on this species or I don't work on this ecosystem. And then in your resolution, in your conclusions, you've shown how those findings are relevant to other ecosystems and many other species. Um, in this case, you've, you've not promised enough. So the opening is specific, the resolution is broad, and that means that a lot of readers won't grasp the importance of the study, or they won't think that the study is relevant to them. So balancing, balancing this, this, this hourglass structure is really quite important. So the opening must give that wide context, but narrow down to the challenge. And then the discussions and the conclusions show how the challenge has been addressed and the link between the conclusions and this wider context that we've given right at the beginning of the paper needs to be clear and concrete. Any questions so far? And am I, am I, uh, is the speed okay with everybody? Or do you need me to slow down? Um, hands up if the speed's okay. Okay, thanks. Um, and and then hands up if you want me to slow down a bit. Great. Okay, that's good. That's good. To, oh. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Okay, I'll try and slow down a little bit. Um, at the moment, we're we're looking at we're looking at fairly general information, um, and it will I will keep repeating this um, this stuff. So, the these three the the key points to to remember here is this opening challenge and the resolution. They're really important, and they're the most important positions in the paper for the reader. Of course, we as scientists, we tend to focus on the details and we're interested in, in all of the details that, that go into um, the paper, all the data and the analyses. And, and you can see here on this, this graph, the action is actually, um, like I said, it's, it's, of course it's important. It's important for the rigor of the study showing that it's robust, but for the reader to understand the story it's these three positions that are most important. And the interesting thing is that obviously this is, it's kind of beginning, middle and end, right? Um, of a story. We also have the beginning, um, the middle and the, and then, and then the happy end, hopefully. And we can also think about um, uh, this beginning, middle and end pretty much all the way through the paper. And we can use what we call story arcs to create bridges, right? Um, from to get from this the opening through to the resolution. So we're going from the opening, we build tension, if you like, as we get to the challenge. Then we provide the action, and then we're relieving that tension again as we get to the resolution. So these story arcs are like bridges where the beginning and the end are what we call power positions. They need to match. So opening, resolution, and we're showing how the work fits in the wider context and how it contributes to research in that area. And it's these story arcs that create a really clear flow of information and logic throughout the paper. Now, at the moment, everything is a bit abstract. I am going to show you examples, but I'd like to show you first why these story arcs, this, this concept of story arcs is really important. Because this is, you know, right now we're looking at the whole paper. 
but we can think about each part of the paper as having its own arc. So each arc basically has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Our paper, this is opening, challenge, action, resolution, but then the individual sections also have pretty much a beginning, middle, and end, the paragraphs, and even the sentences. So we can think of building our paper up in units. So each of these arcs is a unit, and each unit should make a single clear point. And that is really, really important. Something that I see an awful lot in, in writing, whether that's um, um, native English speakers or people writing in English as a foreign language, it doesn't really matter. People will look at a paragraph and go, oh, that paragraph's too long and break it in two. And that for the reader is really confusing because a paragraph signals the end of one topic and the start of a new one. And if you break a paragraph in two just because you think it's too long, the reader is expecting a new topic when you start a new paragraph. It's the same with a sentence. Sentences should be self-contained. And obviously the sections, we know that they're a single unit because they have titles, introduction methods, results, discussion, conclusions. So thinking about the fact that each of these units has a point, a single point, one purpose, and we need to make that clear. That's a really powerful way of making sure we create arcs, story arcs. Then, as you can see in this, this very simple um, diagram, these arcs are linked. So sentences within a paragraph should be linked and paragraphs within a section should be linked. Create. We'll have a look at how we can create arcs and create these links, but they're, one of the reasons they work so well is that if we can't link the information between sentences and we can't link the sentences within a paragraph, that means there's something in the wrong place. So that means we have extra material that needs to be removed because it's breaking our arc. By thinking of everything as a unit, we can also make sure that we've resolved each topic before we start a new one. And that's also very important for, for the reader's understanding of the paper and being able to follow our line of reasoning. And I'm going to give examples for, for, for these things um, shortly. Um, yeah, the most important thing here really is to think of each, each part of the paper. So each sentence, each paragraph and each section as having a purpose and being a unit. That's a really good way to start. Then there are some very simple tricks for creating these arcs. So first of all, um, if we're looking, for example, at, at a paragraph, we start each paragraph with a topical sentence. So this is just a sentence that, that opens the paragraph and tells us what the paragraph is going to be about. What is the topic of this paragraph? Then we start giving more detail to support that topical sentence. So here we're narrowing down, we're using our funneling to build in detail and build up complexity so the reader can, can follow. And then we can end the paragraph with either a statement that resolves the topic. So here we have our resolution within the paragraph, or we can use a statement that links to the topical sentence of the next paragraph. It's also very nice to create a nice flow of reasoning, or we can do both. And I want to show you an example here. Um, I don't I don't expect you to read um, this this uh, this entire um, uh, this entire paragraph. I've basically colored it um, and and shown you the, the the paragraph structure on the left. So at the top um, in blue, this is the topical sentence. So the paragraph starts in the Arctic tundra tundra of Alaska. Plant growth is limited by nitrogen availability, especially in the Tussock community. So based on this sentence, we know where we are. We're in the Arctic tundra of Alaska. We know that we're going to be talking about plant growth and nitrogen limitation and um, the Tussock community, so the vegetation pretty much. 
Then um, the next paragraph, uh, the next sentence, sorry, gives um, additional information to back up that sentence, so to explain this nitrogen limitation. So even where all nitrogen content is relatively high, nitrogen availability is low because, and so on and so forth. Then the third sentence, uh, or the third and fourth sentence, um, give more detail. So they're, here we're describing the processes involved. So now we're talking about decomposition, we're talking about um, laboratory incubations that have, have demonstrated a certain principle. So we've, we've already gone from Arctic tundra of Alaska, nitrogen limitation, down to organic matter and decomposition. So we've, we've funneled really nicely there. And then um, toward, and then we're building in complexity, in this case, climate change. So what is gonna happen with this soil organic matter decomposition and nitrogen availability when, um, uh, when climate change happens? And then the implications of climate change are described. So we really have gone from very broad um, to, to the specific issue, complications of climate change. And then the resolution at the end of the paragraph shows us, um, uh, kind of gives us a, a, a almost a conclusion. So here, as a result, nitrogen supply to plants is one of the primary factors regulating the carbon balance of the Arctic tundra. So this is, this is really nice. We've reinforced that first sentence of the paragraph, we've come full circle. So we've given the topic, we've provided lots of evidence, we've built in com complexity, and then the final sentence rounds everything off and highlights the importance of this topic. If you then look at the, the sentence at the bottom in orange, that's the start of the next paragraph. Net nitrogen mineralization has been considered to be the principal control on plant nitrogen availability. So here we've now introduced a new topic, nitrogen mineralization. And the nice thing is that the, the last sentence of the first paragraph here in yellow links to this um, new sentence of the next paragraph, even though it has basically resolved the previous paragraph. So what the authors have done here is they've they've introduced the main um, the main topic, the vegetation and and sort of the, the the basic problem all in a single paragraph, and then the next paragraph tells us which particular aspect of this of this broader topic they're going to address. So net nitrogen mineralization. They've resolved the first topic before they started the new one. So they've that, that final sentence rounds things off, brings that paragraph to a conclusion, but it still links to the next one. And this is a really, really powerful structure. So we, we here we can see a story arc just within the paragraph, um, the opening, um, the, um, the challenge and the resolution all within a single paragraph. And then we can see the link to the next paragraph. So somebody's just asked, um, what is the recommended length of a sentence? <laughs> that's um, that's one of those questions. What is the length of a piece of string? Um, a sentence can be long as long as it's very, very clear and easy to understand. Um, personally, um, I don't like lots of long, as of very, very long sentences. And, um, and it's usually better to keep sentences short um, or shorter if you can. The key thing is when determining the length of a sentence is, is the sentence a single unit? Is it a unit of thought? Or have you, in, have you tried to cram too much into the sentence? So that's, that's basically the principal um, consideration about how long should the sentence be? Another thing to think about is, uh, and we'll come we'll come on to sentence structure later. Um, if you have a very long sentence, the chances are that the reader might miss important information in that sentence. If you can break the sentence into two and create two individual units of thought, um, then you can actually use that to highlight important um, topics. 
So one thing that you see in a lot of papers is um, as you're reading, you will see a statement in a fairly short, maybe a fairly short sentence. And then the next sentence will start with however, or nonetheless, nevertheless, thus, therefore. These words, I, I like to think of them as link words. And they're great for breaking long sentences up and highlighting things. So you give a topic in a sentence um, and then you put the word however, and that however is a signal to the reader that there's something important coming, but it's still linked to the previous sentence. So you have, there you might have two units of thought that are nicely linked through the word however. And it's a great way of breaking up sentences and showing the reader that there's, there's something coming that they need to pay attention to. And I'll, I'll come back to sentences um, later. So hopefully that's answered the question for now. So this is a good example, right? This is a really good example of how to structure um, a, a, a paragraph. Um, and I'd now like you to have a look at the paragraph on the next slide. Um, I'm not going to say whether it's a good or a bad example. You should hopefully be able to notice that yourself. Um, it's a it's a fairly short paragraph. I want to know, does the paragraph make a single clear point? Is that single clear point in, indicated in the topical sentence? Are the sentences linked within the paragraph? And are there any broken story arcs? So is there information that breaks the flow of logic? And we'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at that together. Um, for now, I'd like you to read through the paragraph briefly. And then basically, um, um, if you think that this paragraph is well written and well structured, I'd like you to put your hand up. So if you like the paragraph and you found it really clear to answer these questions, um, put your hand up. OK, I'll give you I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, I don't see any hands. Hopefully that means you've come to a conclusion. Um, who found this paragraph difficult to follow? And these questions hard to answer. Hands up if you found it quite hard to follow. Yeah, most people found it hard to follow, I think. So this this is this is a real example. Um, um, I've I've removed the citations and I've I've taken a little bit of detail out, but the structure is is real. And this paragraph is written by a native English speaker. The English is fine. There's nothing wrong with the English. The problem with this paragraph is the structure and the fact that that 
information that you expect to find in certain places is in the wrong place. So if we have a quick look at that, um, I've now I've now colored things by topic. So the paragraph starts, light is considered the most limiting resource in the understory of a tropical forest. And that signals to us, that's the topical sentence, that's our opening, that is signaling to the reader that this paragraph is about light, okay? But then you can see the next sentence is already a different color. The next sentence, one model of nutrient limitation. It's like, hang on a minute, we've just gone from light to nutrients. How does that work? So we've we've changed the we've already changed the topic. This this paragraph is not about a single unit. It's not a single unit. It's not about a single topic. Then we come to the third sentence, and the third sentence introduces yet another topic, which is nutrient addition. There is obviously a link here to light, highly shaded conditions, but we've already broken the arc. We've broken the arc by say by starting with light, moving to nutrients, then we've gone to nutrient addition, then we've come back to nutrient limitation, then we go back to light, and then finally, the, at the end of the paragraph, we can see that this paper is actually going to be about nutrient limitation of seedling growth. So this is a really nice example of how it do, the, the wrong structure can give you completely the wrong impression of the paper, but also be really confusing to the reader. So here, basically, we have the topical sentence showing that the paragraph, and in this case, this is the first paragraph of the introduction. So we expect both the paragraph and the paper to be about light because, the, because of this topical sentence. That is our opening. And in this case, this is the wrong opening. The opening is, is actually in the, it, it's in the wrong, it, well, that's not an opening. So that information is in the wrong place. So that's, this is the first big problem. And you can see that the study is actually about nutrient limitation, but you have to read the whole paragraph to find that out. That should be in the first sentence. So the first sentence should be about nutrient limitation, not about light. This nutrient addition is a new topic that's been introduced in the middle um, and it kind of breaks the flow. So that breaks up our, our story arc. It doesn't work. We've gone because we're going from one model of nutrient limitation, and then we're going to another model of nutrient limitation. And this information here on nutrient addition breaks the, the link between those two models of nutrient limitation. And this is how we can work out that that information is in the wrong place. We can't actually link these two bits of information easily. So a better way of structuring this paragraph would be to start off by talking about um, nutrients being limited in um, tropical forest, introducing both of the models of nutrient limitation, then introducing um, the concept of, of, of nutrient addition or multiple limiting resources and light being one of them, introducing nutrient addition experiments, um, and then uh, and then showing that, that actually um, there's, there's contrary evidence and um, this is why it needs testing. So that would be a much better structure. So big nutrient, nutrient limitation um, hypotheses, uh, or starting off big with nutrient limitation being important for plant growth in tropical forest, then giving these um, these different models of nutrient limitation, then bringing in the idea of experimental tests showing um, uh, pros and cons or evidence um, or or not for these um, for these different models, and then bringing in um, uh, the the purpose of the study. And that way, we've gone from general nutrient limitation in tropical forest um, to the specifics of specific models of nutrient limitation, the influence of light or the interaction between light and nutrients, and then the purpose of the study. So that would be a really nice structure and a good way of funneling. This structure doesn't work. 
So what I want you to do, um, hopefully this is this is normally an exercise that I would do during workshops um, because we're doing this as, as an online webinar um, and it takes some time. Um, it's uh, I, I'd like you to try this at home. And this is this is really, really important. Um, it's it's a really good way of of working out how to apply these techniques and working out why some papers are better than others to read. So I'd like you to find two papers. I'm quite sure um, it'll be easy for you to, to think of papers that you've read and you found really easy to understand. And then think of a paper that is entirely relevant to you and your subject area, but you found hard to read. You found hard to understand what it was about and what, what, why the study was important and those things. So pick two papers and then apply this exercise to those two papers. So have a look at the introduction and ask yourself, does each paragraph make a single clear point? Are the paragraphs within a section linked? Are there broken arcs? And is each topic resolved before the next one is introduced? And see if you can pinpoint in the introduction of the paper the opening, the challenge, and the resolution. Are they there? Are they in the right place? So please do, please do have a go at, at this one at, at home, because um, I think you should find that when you find a paper easy to read and easy to understand, you can, um, you can answer these questions. Um, so each paragraph makes a single clear point, there are clear topical sentences. There's a clear opening challenge and resolution. The um, paragraphs are linked within a section and the topics are resolved before the next one is introduced. And there shouldn't be any broken arcs. Whenever you're reading a paper and you suddenly go, hang on a minute, they've lost me. I was following this fine and now I'm lost. I don't know what they're talking about. Have a look at that, that section of the paper you will probably find one of these broken arcs. So a new topic that's been introduced before the previous one has been resolved, or um, you'll find that that information can't easily be linked with um, the rest of the information in the paragraph. Okay, any questions on this? And I, I really do recommend looking at some, analyzing papers in this way um, to see how, how people, you know how it works okay so this was one type of story structure um this ocar opening challenge action resolution um another type of story structure is much faster paced and it's called lead development and resolution and this this is basically the ocar structure compressed so that it's really fast and this is something that you will see, for example, in a nature paper. So um, the lead gives a brief opening and pretty quickly goes to the challenge. Um, then you have um, the development and that's pretty much everything else that comes after um, giving this opening and the challenge. And the development is sometimes also merged with the resolution. So the resolution isn't always separate. So this is a this is a really fast pace paced um, structure. Um, OCAR might be a little bit more plodding. This helps you get to the point really quickly. And like I said, for essay style papers like um, in Science and Nature, this is the structure that they use. But it's also really suitable for individual sections, paragraphs, and sentences. So if we look at this story structure within a paragraph. The first sentence is the lead. So our topical sentence is the lead. It tells us what the paragraph is about. And then the body of the paragraph, the rest of the text, this funneling um, provides the additional information that the reader needs to understand the relevance of the topic and the context of the study. The final sentence of the paragraph can then be used to provide that resolution, the conclusion, or link to the next paragraph. So obviously we don't always need a resolution. We have this nice lead development structure within the paragraph. So first sentence tells us what it's about. The rest of the paragraph um, 
gives that additional information to understand the relevance um, of the topic. So this is our this is our funnel basically. Then within a sentence, we kind of also have this lead development structure. Um, the start of the sentence tells us what the sentence is about. So this is the topic. And then the additional information goes in the middle of the sentence, if you like. And what is very important in English is that that important information goes at the end of the sentence. This is the stress position. So again, we're thinking of this beginning, middle and end. We're thinking lead development resolution or opening challenge resolution, but even within single sentences. This three part structure is really, really powerful. And here we might refer to the three, one, two sentence structure. That's the order of importance. So the important information is at the end of the sentence, but the start of the sentence is, is, is almost as important because that's that's providing the topic. It's, it's telling us what the sentence is about and then anything else goes in the middle. So this is, like I said, it's, it's our three part structure. So we have beginning, middle and end. We've got lead or opening. We have action or development. Um, and then we have our resolution. And with the sentence, it's topic and stress. And then everything else goes in the middle. So um, I'd like to demonstrate how this works. Um, here you have two sentences. Both sentences mean pretty much the same thing. I'd like to know from you which one works better, which one is easier to understand or easier to read. So have a have a quick read and then and then I'll ask you to put your hands up for one or two. Okay, who thinks sentence one is better? Okay, we've got four, four votes for sentence one, uh, five votes. Um, who thinks sentence two works better? Okay, we have more votes for sentence two. So sentence two in English works a lot better. Quite simply because the first word of the sentence gives us the topic drought. In sentence one, we have this by increasing physiological stress. The sentence isn't about physiological stress, it's about drought. So drought reduces Soil microbial activity by increasing physiological stress, causing a buildup of biodegradable carbon that is rapidly respired upon rewetting. So we know that this, this information that's at the end of the sentence, that's important. That's where the stress is. That's the same in both sentence, but both sentences. But the difference here, the simple difference really is that we've given the topic first in sentence two, then we've given the information that is you know it's extra information we need to explain but it's not it's not that uh, we don't want to highlight it what we want to highlight here is that um this carbon is rapidly respired upon rewetting so now we know um the sentence is about drought and um this rapid rapid re uh, or this respiration um when we rewet after drought is important So the reason that this sentence uh, or that this sentence then works better becomes really apparent when we start stringing sentences together. So now I've, I've added 
a second sentence. So drought, we know this is about drought, reduces soil microbial activity by increasing physiological stress, causing a buildup of biodegradable carbon that is rapidly respired upon wetting. The sharp increase in respired carbon immediately after rewetting is referred to as the Birch effect, and the strength of the Birch effect is often related to the frequency or severity of drought. So this, this is an amazing way to create story arcs all the way through your paper. You link the topic of the new sentence to the stress of the previous one. So the stress of the first sentence is rapidly respired upon wetting. The topic of the following sentence is the sharp increase in respired carbon immediately after rewetting. So all I've done here is I've reworded the stress of the first sentence and I've turned it into the topic of the second sentence. This is a really, really powerful way of creating story arcs throughout your paper. You don't have to do it cookbook like for every single sentence, but you should be able to do it if you wanted to. And the reason you should be able to do this or the, it, is, is that this makes sure that you have a flow of information. Each sentence, it, each sentence is a single unit, but each unit is linked. And you can use this technique. Um, like I said, you don't have to apply it, but you should be able to go through your paper and go, can I link each sentence in a paragraph? And if you can't, then you've got information that is in the wrong place. So this is a really good way of working out where do I have this, this, these, these breaks in my story arcs. Now we can continue with this because I'm starting the next paragraph. I've basically, I've finished my paragraph. It's a very short paragraph. Um, I finished my paragraph and I'm gonna start the next paragraph. Stronger and more frequent droughts are predicted under numerous climate change scenarios. So I've now taken this topic, uh, the stress of my final sentence and I've created a new paragraph. And again, I'm using um, this, this the, the stress as the topic of the new sentence. So whether this is a new paragraph or the next sentence in the paragraph, it doesn't really matter. It creates a really strong link. The only difference is that here I'm starting a new paragraph because I'm, I'm now talking about climate change scenarios. So I've gone from, my first paragraph is about drought, my second paragraph is going to be about the frequency or the strength of droughts. So I've 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 already developed the topics um, and and started a new paragraph. So this this is a really nice exercise um, to do um, when you're when you're writing, but also when you're reading papers. So now um, thinking about your the two papers that you've chosen. Um, you can have a look at the, both the introduction and the discussion, because the, these sections are where it becomes really obvious if people have done this. Have the authors used topical sentences? And where is the most important information in the sentence and the paragraph and the section of the, of the, of the paper? And are these sections and the paragraphs and the sentences, are they linked in some way? And does that make it easier to follow? So this structure, thinking about units, story arcs and links is, is a really powerful way of creating a very strong narrative and a, a flow of information that is easy for a reader to follow. Now, another thing um, that it's very useful for, we know where our stress positions are our power positions. We have, we, we always have um, topic at the beginning and stress at the end, or the opening at the beginning and the resolution at the end. These are our power positions. And what that tells us is that the place for things that we don't want the reader to focus on needs to go in the middle. So whether that's the middle of the sentence or whether it's the middle of the paragraph, that's where you put information that you don't necessarily want the reader to focus on. One way, one good example of using this is in your results section. You can use this in the results section in a sentence. 
um, when you, you're presenting both significant and non-significant results, put the significant results at the end of the sentence. Put the non-significant ones in the middle and make sure that you start the sentence with a, with a, a clear statement or you start the section with a clear statement and then um, you put the non-significant results in the middle of the section. You obviously got to try it out and see what works for your particular situation, but anything you really want the reader to focus on needs to go at the end. That's the stress, the, the resolution. And, and you obviously need to give the context or the opening at the beginning, and then you can put everything else in the middle. Okay. Are there any any questions to this structure? It's all quite abstract, which is why I'm 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 recommending that you really look at you know you'll have the slides, you'll have the webinar, and um and you can you can see how well this works yourselves. And I I think it's really important to do that. Analyzing papers and trying to work out why they're good or why they're not so good. Um, can really help you um, improve your own writing. Um, question uh, in the chat, how much as a reviewer should you point out um, the, the story structure of the paper? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't actually point out a story structure, but I do very frequently as a reviewer, um, I will point out, for example, that the introduction, that the structure doesn't work. And I will also say, uh, you know what I think the structure might should be to help the, the the reader understand the importance of the study, and then I will say, you know, I'll I'll just put four bullet points. I think that a better structure would be this topic, this topic, this topic, this topic. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily refer to the story structure, but I would definitely point out if I think it doesn't work, and I do that I do that very frequently. I do that as an editor as well. Um, especially if, if frequently I'll have um, comments from reviewers saying, I found the discussion really hard to follow. And, you know, that's a valid criticism, but it doesn't really help the authors understand why it was hard to follow. And in that case, as a reviewer, it's really useful if you can say, you know, could you try rephrase or reframing the discussion around the hypotheses? That's an obvious one. Or the introduction doesn't make much sense. Have you tried structuring it in this way? So topic one, topic two, topic three, topic four. So I think as a reviewer, you can definitely make suggestions and it's very, very useful to the authors if you do. Um, if you're not sure, then obviously, if you know, if in doubt, better, better leave it. Um, but if you can, if you can see the obvious the obvious issue, then yes, definitely, definitely comment on the structure and the fact that it 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 doesn't work for the flow of information. Okay, so I've talked quite a lot about um, um, sort of the the opening and the overall structure and and linking things, and of course, um, the resolution is really important. So how how you should conclude the paper, or in this case, how not to conclude the conclude your paper. Um, I, I also introduced this in, uh, in the webinar last week um, about how to write conclusions. And here I want to think, think about the conclusions as the resolution of the paper. So first, the first problem we might encounter is that our resolution is very weak. So the, this I see an awful lot where um, authors will say, oh yes, this is really important in the context of climate change. And yeah, that's a resolution and it's probably also linked to the opening of the paper, but it doesn't tell us how or why it's important. Um, another type of weak resolution is that, um, that questions, questions remain unanswered, but they haven't been discussed um, uh, or, or highlighted as, as being unanswered and, and you know, subject of another study. And um, or the understanding that has 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 been gained from the study isn't synthesized into into new knowledge, new directions, new research. 
Then um, there are distractions. The, these are also very weak resolutions. Um, so basically, um, the, the conclusions are just hand sweeping generalizations um, or, or repeating existing information. Uh, and also in your conclusion section, you shouldn't introduce new information. So um, the conclusion section should be entirely based on the information you've already presented in the discussion or the introduction. You shouldn't be introducing new concepts or new ideas. And then, of course, there's the problem of undermining conclusions. So, for example, um, including the limitations, sometimes you're, you're asked to do this, um, including the limitations in the conclusion um, is yeah, I don't think it's great at the conclusions. I think it should be done in the discussion. If you're asked to do it, you give the limitations, but you then show how the limitations of the study um, actually raise new questions or point to new research directions. And another thing that I see over and over again is the sweeping statement, further research is needed. If you're a reviewer or an editor and you see this statement, that indicates that you that your study is not sufficient to answer the questions. So instead of having that further research is needed, um, you can say exactly what is needed and how your study um, has brought you to that conclusion. So to think, when we start thinking about writing the conclusions, um, we can go back to our story structure and we can work backwards so I, I mentioned last week that the, that the conclusions is kind of the introduction in reverse. So we start with, we show how we've, we've resolved the issue and, and then we work backwards through to the challenge, the opening. And that way we make sure that we've balanced our hourglass in the paper. So we're highlighting the key message of the paper. We're summarizing the steps that, you, that, that, um, that we took to get there and um, Obviously, um, we need to then also highlight the achievements of the study and show how it's going to generate new research and conclude then with the emerging questions or new research directions. And of course, we need to link back to our opening. So we need to come full circle with our conclusions and show how the research and the, the, um, the conclusions, the findings, the new questions will help address that big issue that we provided at the start of the introduction. So good resolutions link back to the opening of the introduction and good resolutions show how the paper has advanced our understanding, which I talked about quite a bit last week. So um, we can we can basically write uh, or create kind of a three point plan to to um, to write strong resolutions. Um, basically, write a brief synopsis of the key results. So not not um, we're not writing another abstract. We're just saying what are our key results? What do I need to provide in the conclusions? And then we can synthesize those to show how we answered our research question or how we addressed our research aims. And then we need to, we also need to remember to show the reader how this contributes to the wider issue that we presented in the introduction. So these, these sort of three points are a really good way of thinking about what information we need to put in the conclusions and how do we how do we go about writing the conclusions? And the conclusions don't need to be long. They can they can be one short paragraph or a few sentences. Now, I've underlined the word synthesize here. Um, and last week I talked, I talked a lot about synthesizing and I said, we will look at this briefly this week. Um, and so I, I do want to spend um, pretty much the rest of the session um, looking at how to synthesize, because this is, this is really abstract. It's hard to teach, it's hard to describe. And um, and it's it's quite hard to learn, and a lot of people get it wrong um, when they start out writing, me included, obviously. So synthesizing information is is an important writing skill because it means that you're able to combine different aspects of your ideas and your research with the ideas of others 
to produce something new. So you can think about this like the ingredients, um, the, these individual aspects, combine them together to make a lovely cake. Um, you're integrating or synthesizing something, you're combining one thing with another to form a whole, and hopefully a new whole. So this idea of synthesis is really important if you're writing a literature review. So synthesizing information from multiple, multiple sources, you're demonstrating common patterns and emerging ideas. But in the text of a primary research paper, um, you're, you're basically synthesizing the results of previous research to provide context in the introduction. You're also then synthesizing the results of different measurements or different experiments to show how the study has answered the research questions. So this is obviously um, in, in the discussion. And also in the discussion, you're integrating your results with published findings to provide context and interpretation. And you want to do that without distracting from your own work. Um, I also, I showed last, last week, um, one, of the, one of the weak discussions is when um, findings are only ever provided in comparison to published work. And that doesn't really give interpretation and it highlights other people's work instead of your own results. And you can avoid that by using um, techniques to synthesize the information. Um, I want to very briefly introduce this concept, SOAR, so select, organize, associate, reflect. It's particularly useful for writing literature reviews. Um, and I could go into this in quite a bit of detail, which I'm, I'm not going to today for, for, for literature reviews. Um, but it's also quite relevant if you're writing, when you're writing a paper and, and you've done your literature work and you're thinking about the discussion, writing the discussion and the introduction. So select is quite simply choosing the appropriate sources. So these are the, the papers that you're going, to, you're going to cite and making notes about aspects that are directly relevant to your study. Then you want to organize those notes so that you can see whether there are broad themes and you want to group related information. Um, if you're using a lot of information, like for a literature review, it's really useful here to use a matrix or a mind map or something to try and group related information. Based on those groups and that organize those broad themes, you can start to associate ideas. So connecting multiple ideas, connecting statements, connecting studies around relationships or patterns. And then looking back at these, these general patterns or these ideas and thinking about how you can use those relationships or patterns to support your work or your case, the arguments that you're making. So this is, this is quite a, a useful technique to, to really try and organize all of that information uh, and, and, and all of your literature to, to, um, to help write your introduction, your discussion, or your literature review. And I'd, I'd like to give you, um, because this idea of synthesis um, is quite abstract, I'd like to give you um, uh, a couple of examples. So this, this here is an example from a discussion. Um, have a quick read and tell me if it is synthesized. Do you think this is good synthesis? Um, so have a quick read and then put your hands up if you think it is not a good synthesis.
So hands up if it's not a good synthesis. And if you can tell me why it's not a good synthesis, please write so in the chat. And then hands up if you think it is a good synthesis. And again, if you if you if you can tell me why you think it's a good synthesis, um, please write it in the chat. And then I think we have quite a lot of people who are not sure whether this is a good synthesis or not. Okay, yeah. So it's not a good synthesis because it highlights someone else's work. This is, this. that's correct. And also it has mixed concepts. That's also correct. But there's, there's a really, there's, there's a really telling point to this that I'm gonna show you um, it's basically, if we take this paragraph and we split the sentences, we can turn it into bullet points. We have a list of four completely separate statements here. So if, if the text reads like a list of separate statements, the, the information hasn't been properly synthesized. So in this case, it's like one, two, three, four. We have four very separate points, right? So what we can do is we can we a synthesis would take these four points and present general ideas and that often results in more concise text and then to avoid highlighting other people's work this is i mean in in the social sciences um we would give references like this because um in the social sciences it's much more important to highlight um um the authors in, in ecology, we tend to give most of our citations um, like this in, in parentheses, unless it's really important to highlight um, who the authors are. So here's our synthesis. We demonstrate that grazing can increase the degree of species co-occurrence and thus promote spatial segregation in plant communities. So that's my opening topical sentence um, and it immediately shows sort of the, the, the main finding that I'm going to discuss. Then, however, the extent of spatial segregation likely depends on grazing intensity as a result of biomass consumption. So now I'm presenting my the evidence from other people's work. We found that species co-occurrence and spatial segregation were promoted by livestock selection for more palatable species, demonstrating the importance of herbivore feeding preferences in shaping plant community composition. So now I've really linked those four statements. I've made the text more concise and um, and it is now synthesized. So now I'm I'm really highlighting our results and I'm and and I'm still providing evidence from the literature. Um Ashley, your hand is still raised. Do you do you have a question? Okay. Um, great. So basically, now I've taken these four separate uh, these four separate statements, and and I've 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 pulled them together to to show um, sort of more general patterns. And if we go back to the original statements, um, you can you can see that um, in this case, it's sort of um this this second statement by Saez and Alados, um, that's a study specific. Um, and then the other two are also um uh they're they're more general, but they're given as completely separate statements. And here they've been built into the text. So synthesizing statements often ends up in a more concise text. Right. We have an, um, uh, a few sort of um, uh, examples here about synthesizing results in the discussion. So very common issues that I see are, for example, 
um, that the text repeats the results and then gives interpretation from the literature in a separate sentence. This is really, really common. This is how I started writing my discussion as well um, when, I, when I started writing papers. So the first sentence says, we found that litter from pioneer tree species decompose faster than litter from old growth forest species. So that's, I, you know, I've started with one of our main findings. It's topical sentence. It's clear what the, what the, the, the paragraph is about. But then in a separate sentence, previous research has shown that blah, blah, blah. So here I've given my result as, a, uh, as the first sentence, and then I've given an explanation. And that's, that's fine, but it's not synthesized. So one way of doing this, or two ways of doing this, there are two solutions. The first is to put the explanation first. So here I'm starting general again, high nitrogen content of pioneer tree species represents a valuable resource to decomposers, which explains why litter from pioneers decompose faster than litter from old growth forest species in our study. So here I've, I've, I've actually given the explanation first and I've started general um, and then I've, I've given our result. The second solution, is just is quite simply to rephrase the result and then combine the two sentences into one. So here it is likely that litter from pioneer tree species decomposed faster than litter from old growth forest species because pioneers have leaves with high nitrogen content. So in this case, the information in all three cases, the information is exactly the same. But in our first case, I've repeated a result and then I've given an explanation. And a lot of reviewers will point this out. The discussion repeats results. And that's quite simply because the information hasn't been synthesized properly. These two solutions, um, you know, it obviously which one is best depends on the rest of the text, it depends on the context, it depends on the position within the paragraph and so on and so forth. But both of them are really simple ways of making sure I don't have that issue of repeating results. Okay. One more, uh, one more um, uh, example, um, and I'm again. This is uh, this time. This is an example from a literature review. Um, here, and uh, because we're running out of time, I'll go through it very quickly. Here, we basically have. Um, the problem that this is what we call a catalog, right? So here we have um, uh, the topical sentence, rate of temperature variability in the in the temperate zone. Soil temperature has a, a much more significant role in nitrogen and nitrous oxide fluxes. It's not a very it's not a very good topical sentence to start with. But then we have these guys showed this. These guys showed this. And then in another study, they showed this. So this is what we call a catalog. So we've just listing studies. We're, we're providing evidence, which is fine, but we it, it reads like a list of studies. So here um, we've, we've got all of these examples as kind of individual examples. And that's another indication that we haven't synthesized the information very well. And the solution here um, is that we obviously we want to demonstrate general patterns and big ideas and that involves cutting a lot of detail out. So here we now have as there is greater temperature variability in the temperate zone soil temperature plays a much more significant role in both methane and N2O fluxes than in the tropics. There's some information that was missing in the previous version and then high variation in soil N2O and CO2 fluxes can be uh, still be observed up to two weeks after changes in soil temperature and methane oxidation is particularly strongly related to increasing soil temperatures. So there we've now we've now synthesized all of this information and we've made it we've made it general we've made it much broader. Ideally we would also find some extra citations to make sure that it is a little bit broader that, that this is broadly applicable and not specific to these individual studies. But again, synthesizing information 
we're, we're cutting out detail and we're demonstrating general patterns. So it's another good thing to, to look out for. So just to summarize um, this, this uh, section on synthesizing information, we are taking bits of information and we're trying to combine them in a way that we're creating something new. We can do this in when we work towards addressing really clear aims and questions. So especially in the discussion of a primary research paper, framing them around our research questions and aims or framing the discussion around the hypotheses is a good way to start. And then obviously we're trying to use connections, relationships and general patterns rather than individual examples and rather than detail. And then we only really want to use case studies when we when we need to demonstrate something or clarify something complex. And that that's a really good a good way of, of, of working towards pulling the information together and showing something a little bit more general, a bit of a bigger picture. OK. So basically, um, I guess to summarize pretty much both both sessions, um, when you're writing a paper, you you need to think about telling a story. You need to think about about writing a narrative that has a clear arc and it has a clear beginning, middle and end. There is a flow of information. Then obviously a paper needs to be simple and concrete and credible. So simple, I don't mean simplistic, I mean simple language, not you know breaking down complexity, explaining complex concepts, making sure the reader can really follow the flow of information. Um, a, good, a good discussion especially, um, but a good paper overall synthesizes the knowledge that's been gained from the study into new understanding. And the paper should obviously conclude with really strong take home messages that demonstrate an advance to the field. So um, I'm going to um, leave you with a, a writing checklist um, that is is kind of for the for the same uh, for the for the whole paper uh, and for both sessions. So first, um, the relevance of the question needs to be clear. That's our opening and our challenge. Um, we need to show how the study aims and hypotheses address that question. The aims, hypotheses, methods, results, and conclusions are all really clearly connected. Um, the relevance of the findings is clear. And then obviously we've avoided too much, too much jargon. We've explained concept, complex concepts. We've used evidence to provide interpretation and we've made sure that our conclusions meet the reader's expectations. So that's kind of a, a very basic right, uh, checklist for telling, uh, telling a story about your research and creating a strong narrative. And um, with that, if anyone has any more questions, uh, please pop them in the chat now. Um, I've got a few more minutes before I have to run. Um, and I think you can also email, um, was it the Functional Ecology Office, um, Amelia, I think, um, if, if you have questions after um, the webinar or later on when you're thinking about things. Um, thank you very much um, for your time this afternoon. And I really hope um, that was helpful. Um, question, do you have sources to learn more about writing in synthesis? Um, have a look at my editorial about uh, review papers. That um, there's, there's, quite a, there's quite a bit in there about um, synthesis writing. Um, but I keep thinking that I probably need to write something about how to synthesize information. It's, it's not easy. So there's now the email address you can send questions to in the chat. Great. No more questions. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon, evening, um, wherever you are. Um, and yeah. I really hope you can you can put you can use these techniques. <laughs>